We begin tonight with a debt ceiling deal and the wrath of the pro-default caucus. I am sure you've heard by now that after marathon talks over the weekend, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy reached an agreement on a deal to suspend the debt ceiling. Suspend, not raise. That's important, and I will get back to that in a minute. The House is expected to vote on the bill tomorrow. The House Rules Committee met today to vote on whether it will make it to the floor, the first procedural hurdle for the deal. But if you want to know whether the deal itself is any good, take a listen to who's mad about it, the far-right House Freedom Caucus. This deal fails, fails completely. And that's why these members and others will be absolutely opposed to the deal, and we will do everything in our power to stop it. Be very clear, not one Republican should vote for this deal. It is a bad deal. In short, tomorrow's bill is a bunch of fake news. We're not going to default. We're going to choose. They're going to say this. Let's call their bluff on it. The best deal is no deal. <laughs> now, it is important to note, those members of the House Freedom Caucus were never going to vote for the debt deal. They said so in advance. It doesn't you know, punch poor people in the face enough, like their bill. So it was a no from the jump. In fact, one of those members, Texas's lynching glorifier, Chip Roy, vowed to kill it in the House Rules Committee, calling it a, quote, turd sandwich. The deal doesn't raise the debt limit by a fixed amount. It actually just suspends it until 2025, meaning the Treasury Department can borrow whatever it needs to pay our national bills. And in true Republican Scooby-Doo villain fashion, North Carolina's Dan Bishop said the quiet part way loud <laughs> about that. It removes the issue from the national conversation during the presidential election to come. How could you more successfully kneecap any Republican president than to take that issue out of his or her hands? Okay, again, these people said in advance that they wouldn't vote for any deal. So now that they got the nothing that you're entitled to when you promise not to vote for anything, they're just being honest about why. Bishop also became the first Republican to openly call for Speaker Kevin McCarthy's job over the agreement. He told Politico, the one-person motion to vacate should absolutely be on the table to oust McCarthy. It has to happen, he said. That was also always going to happen <laughs> after Kevin McCarthy sold his soul to the pro-default caucus to get the 15 votes that he needed to grasp the speaker's gavel. But while Kevin, you know, isn't exactly the brightest light in the candelabra, if he has made this deal with President Biden, it stands to reason that he also made a deal with enough Republicans and Democrats to vote for it and for him in a no-confidence vote. And because it's a negotiated deal, not everyone got everything they wanted. But there are a lot of clear wins for President Biden. Republicans will call new work requirements a victory, even though work requirements for SNAP food aid are currently federal law for people under 50 with no dependents. The deal extends the age from 49 to 54. But veterans and the homeless are exempted from the new work requirements which the White House says would likely offset the increased age limits, leaving the number of adults subject to the work requirements unchanged. Republicans are also crowing that the deal cuts spending by limiting non-defense spending. But what they actually got is spending that will remain roughly flat for the next two years, and they can go home and tout increased defense spending of a whopping $866 billion, which was already President Biden's budget request. And Republicans can tell their mean-spirited little base that, you know, they didn't raise the debt limit because suspend means it just went away, like the wind. But cry more, MAGA Republicans, because the reality is you didn't get what you wanted, but everyone had to give a little. And that is how deals and adulting work. And it turns out President Biden is really, really good at this. If you're old enough to remember 2011, the first time Republicans used the threat of default to hold our economy hostage under President Barack Obama and got the U.S. its first credit downgrade in the process, that deal to save us from default was brokered by, drum roll, none other than Vice President Joe Biden. And while then Speaker John Boehner portrayed it as an own the libs win for Republicans, at the time, officials said Boehner ultimately didn't get much. Joining me now is David Pluff, former Obama campaign manager and MSNBC political analyst, and Sahil Kapoor, 
NBC News senior national political reporter. Um, let's start with what's in this deal. I'm just going to put it up. Suspends the debt ceiling for two years, meaning it will not be an issue, as Re Republican Scooby-Doo villain uh, admitted. Cap spending for two years at 2023 levels. Claws back unspent COVID funds, meaning money that's just sitting there gets clawed back. Restart student loan payments, adds these work requirements, except veterans, the homeless, and people aging out of foster care. It cuts the IRS's budget, and it does permit some energy, uh, ener uh, sort of permitting for energy and fully funds veterans' medical care. What are Democrats and the Republicans who actually were in play to actually vote for this actually saying about this style? Well, Joy, the spending cuts are too modest for some House Freedom Caucus Republicans. This was always going to be the case. They were barely satisfied with a much more aggressive bill that House Republicans passed on a party line basis. They were never going to be on board for a compromise. They were always going to vote no. The question uh, for Kevin McCarthy, for the Speaker, was can he minimize those losses and get the vast majority of his Republican conference on board? We will find out what the answer to that is, but so far, so good for him. His leadership team is projecting confidence. A lot of members outside the Freedom Caucus we spoke to uh, also say they're on board with this. They're trying to focus on what's in the bill. Republicans who are focusing on what's in the bill, uh, you know, are more supportive of it. And the House Republicans who are uh, focusing on what's not in the bill, all these steeper cuts that they wanted are voting against it. We'll see where the numbers break down tomorrow, Joy, but we know uh, House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries has said he expects 150 Republicans to support it. That is two-thirds of the conference. Democrats do not want to carry this over the line themselves. This was a deal that, of course, they were not in the room for. It was House Republican leaders and the White House in the room. They believe it's the job of the House majority to carry it over the line. Progressives have also expressed some concerns with this. But at the end of the day, Joy, I think Democrats have so much invested in this economically they want to prevent a catastrophic uh, default. And politically, they're invested in President Biden's success. They need him to be successful in order for themselves to be successful, and they're not going to let this fail. Uh, this bill is in decent shape to pass the House. And then it goes over to the Senate with just about five days or so if it passes yeah. tomorrow before that crucial deadline. So, so these are the members of the, of the Rules Committee. They're trying to sort of hold it up in the Rules Committee. Uh, Thomas Massey, who's indicated he's going to vote for it. Ralph Norman, Chip Roy. Um, those are the sort of problem members, um, Sahil. Any of those members seem like they're going to jump ship and, and prevent it from getting out of rules? Well, right now, the Rules Committee has nine Republicans and four Democrats. So let's just keep the Democrats aside for one moment and see if seven out of those nine Republicans vote for it. That is a majority. Thomas Massey appears to be a yes. And there are uh, six other McCarthy allies whose votes were never really in question. So this bill is in good shape to get out of the Rules Committee, whether or not Democrats vote uh, for it. The, the tradition around here is that typically the majority party has to carry these procedural votes in committees. So even though a lot of Democrats are going to vote for it on the floor of the House, some of them might vote against the procedural rule to go forward. But, you know, Chip Roy and, and Ralph Norman are also on the Rules Committee. They yeah. are, are very critical of this bill. They can vote against it, and it still uh, would have uh, the votes to pass just on Republican strength, Joy. Yeah, and, and you know what? I'm going to say, so what, David Pluff, as I come over to you? If you literally say, I will never vote for anything, there's nothing that you could put in a bill that I will ever vote for, you're literally iced out of the conversation. So that was a dumb strategy to begin with. But I, I do want to go to this sort of, they sort of have it both ways thing. So Nancy Mays, this was her quote. She said uh, she doesn't like the bill either. She says she's not going to vote for it. She goes back and forth between being a normie and a MAGA. She says, I'm voting no on the debt ceiling debacle because playing the D.C. game isn't worth selling out our kids and grandkids. Republicans got outsmarted by a president who can't find his pants. So let's just say, let's just say she's right. Let's just pretend you know Biden, so you know he can find his pants. Let's say he didn't. And he's pantsless in the White House right now, doesn't know where they're at. He still beat them. What does that say about them if they believe that he is mentally incontinent, but he's still beating them at this game? That means to me that they are completely irrelevant and they, they don't know what they're doing. They're literally insulting themselves, trying to insult him. He beat them again. Your thoughts, David Plouffe? Well, they're just not serious about governing most of them. Uh, and listen, Biden, I was in the rooms with him in 2011 when he was talking to McConnell and Boehner and Democrats. Uh, because we got very close to defaulting back then. So I think, listen, this is really not on the level. So the people who are criticizing, we're never going to vote for it. This isn't the type of thing that's going to get 300 votes in the House. It'll get 218, 220, 222. McCarthy and Jeffries probably have all this wired no matter what press releases and, and outbursts happen. Uh, and at the end of the day, the big thing, the specifics matter, but the big thing is the country's not going to default. <laughs> 
which is most importantly uh, from an economic and subsistence standpoint. Sure. This is already a pretty weak economy, and we could head into a severe recession, if not a depression. Uh, and then politically, uh, the truth is the House Republicans have a very narrow majority. It's under threat. I'm sure most of the vulnerable Republicans in the House did not want to fall. Obviously, the White House doesn't want to fall. Senate, you know, members who are in tough races don't want to fall. So the, the big thing to me is the substance before the politics, which is, and that's what scared me all along, is there's too many Republicans who believe default, they either don't believe it's actually a default, it's not real, it's fake, it's like right. a government shutdown. And of course, it, those two things could not be further from each other. So the good news is now, of course, we're going to have this debate again in 25 and 27, and at some point we've got to stop having this ridiculous debate and handle this like every American family or business does, which is we pay the bills that we rack up without yeah. any extra drama or debate. But I think that's where we're heading. And, and Biden, listen, I think he knew that the, this economy could not withstand a shock like a default, even if it was a temporary one. Uh, and he had to make some concessions uh, to make sure that didn't happen. I think they were smart concessions. But once again, he shows that he's kind of a master of the inside game.